Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ Happening Live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the praise world. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, can do better than that. I said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I welcome every one of you to our Bible study tonight. Amen. Bible school tonight. Amen. Wonderful. Amen. Somebody there say, wonderful. wonderful. The Lord will bless everyone abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen. And for those who are coming for the first time, what a wonderful place to be on a Monday night. When I saw you standing up, I said, wonderful. Say wonderful for yourself. Wonderful. The Lord will enrich your life today too in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, make me clean. He'll make us clean. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We are thanking you for our brothers and sisters, our friends who are coming for the first time. We are asking, Lord, that you open the eyes of everyone to the truth of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And for the faithful children of God, brothers and sisters who have been coming week after week. And they are here today. Lord, I pray that the blessing of continuity. And the blessing of faithfulness. You grant to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Our leaders, our pastors, and our overseers, all the people who are gathered together, whether they're here or any other place where we're listening together, and reach every life. Amen. I will pray, Lord, you'll keep us clean until that final day we get into heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. We plead that your spirit will assist us Amen. as we speak and as we hear. Amen. And that this word will do good in every life. Amen. Confirm it, O oh Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can see now. We're coming to John chapter 2. Those who have been coming for some time will know that we're studying from the gospel according to St. John. I have gone through chapter 1. We started chapter 2. Now we're in the second part of chapter 2. And I'm reading here. I read some verses to you. Chapter 2. We're reading from verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. The Lord is on the move. He had been in Canaan of Galilee, and he had done a miracle there, turning water into wine, a creative miracle, a transforming miracle, something that he did by the supernatural power of Christ, of the Son of God, of the very creative power of God himself. And then he went on to Capernaum. And there he demonstrated once again all the, some of the attributes of his deity, of his uh, sonship of God. And then he didn't spend too many days there, you know, passed on. Look at verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, the capital city. He wanted to see now what was going on at the capital. 
I was told in verse 14, I'm found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a coach, a scourge of, of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew their tables and said unto them that sold doors, take these things hence, make not my father's house, tell me, and house of merchandise. You can see what the Lord has done here. You see, it was the beginning of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many, there are many people, if they are starting a ministry like this, and they want to preach the gospel. They say, I want to be very careful. They don't want to show much zeal at the beginning. They don't want to show much excitement at the beginning or much faithfulness at the beginning. I don't want to offend the people. I don't want to do anything that will go the wrong direction with the people so that I will have my ministry without any problem. You see those people, they're not seeking for the glory of God. They're not seeking for the honor of God. They're considering themselves. But Jesus Christ went ahead and did what he ought to do. I pray that such a faithfulness the Lord will give us in Jesus' name. Can you see a balance in the ministry of Jesus? In the first part of chapter 2, he turned water to wine. And that's something that the people wanted. And they were happy. They were joyful. They were excited. What a kind God is this. And what a wonderful miracle is this. See what he has provided for us. When the people needed a miracle, he gave it to them. And when the people needed correction, he gave it to them. That's a balanced ministry. It is not somebody that is, you know, every time he wants to do something that the people will be happy, they'll be excited, and he'll praise him and say, what a wonderful Lord or God is this. But he balanced it up. You'll notice another, another scene. John records this incident that took place at the beginning of his ministry. If you look at Matthew and Mark and Luke, the three of them recorded the same incident, but that incident they recorded took place at the end of Christ's ministry. Look at Matthew chapter 21. We're going, only going to read the account of Matthew chapter 21 because the same thing was recorded by Mark and the same thing recorded by Luke. We're looking at Matthew chapter 21 and I'm reading from verse 12. In verse 12 it says, and Jesus went into the temple of God and he cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the morning changes and the seeds of them that sold those and said unto them it is written my house shall be called the house of prayer but ye have made it tell me a den of thieves you see at the beginning christ did it he drew them out he cleansed the temple and then three years went by and then at the end of his ministry, he came to see them now. And they had come back to the same thing. First of all, understand. Sinners are sinners. Unbelievers are unbelievers. These priests and these ministers of religion, they had not changed. There was no conversion. There was no repentance. At the beginning of the ministry, here is what Jesus Christ uh, com commanded and corrected. And then at the end, three years after, they had come back to the same practice. That means that there was no change in them. You know, there are some ministers, it will correct us once. And uh, they are very firm and they are very strict. And it's like, why did he do that? She must not make my father's house a, a den of robbers, a den of thieves. I must not make this a market. Then if uh, they turn their back and then after three weeks, the same thing came up again. They say, I'll not burn my fingers. 
I'll not destroy myself. It is like these people, they are bent on doing evil. It's like they would not take correction. Okay, up to you, whatever you do. Some people, after three months, after the three years, if they see the same error and the same corruption and the same evil, they say, I'm not going to say anything again because they are incorrigible. Christ is not like that. He wasn't thinking of himself. Am I happy? Am I not happy? When the people obey, am I excited? When they don't obey, does it hurt me? He said, it's not about me. It's about the glory of God. And it's about the honor of the Lord. And because of that, three years after, he still corrected them. You know what the Lord is telling us in this? He's telling us that the temple is built for a purpose. The church is built for a purpose. And as we look at our churches, even the physical church buildings, as, well, as we look at our assemblies, even the physical assemblies, as we look at all the things that we use in worship, the Lord wants us to remember that temples and churches are not built for worldly entertainment. They are not built for bazaars. They are not built for money-making ventures. Or some people will say, look, the church is there. The building is there. And they want to bring market there. They want to bring commercial things there. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, teaching us that the church or the temple is not for that. It is not for gambling or lottery. You'll find some people that they make use of uh, church buildings, religious buildings. They make use of that for lottery or for gambling. It is not for criminal activities. There are some places where you find some criminals, they hide in that church building and they do all their nocturnal, their night, uh, whatever, and all their plans for evil, they do in a church building. Because after all, they're not choosing today is not Sunday and today is not a revival day. All the other days, they take over and they do whatever they want to do. Christ is telling us that temples are not built for that purpose and church buildings are not raised for that purpose it is not for extortion it is not for the commercialization of religion so that through that religion we can make money the people that are so money minded and the love of money takes them away and carries them away and they cannot really do what the lord wants to do a church building temples they're not for marketing and they're not for fund raising that's why christ came at the beginning of his ministry he cleansed the temple and at the end of his ministry, he cleansed the temple. I want you to think about some church buildings, some religious buildings that you know around you. And you know the things that go on there. If Christ were to come today, how will he act in those uh, places, in those temples and in those uh, church buildings? I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 13 uh, and we're looking at verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13 uh, and we're reading from verse tell me verse 8. In verse 8, it says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. First of all, you can tell at the beginning of the ministry, look at what he did. At the end of the ministry, look at what he did. You see consistency there. You see constancy there. You see consecration there. All through the three years, three and a half years he spent in ministry, he did exactly the same thing and preached the same thing and acted the same way if Jesus were to come today to our church buildings what he required at that time is what he required today he'll say don't make my father's house the house of merchandise tonight we are considering the study Christ cleansing the temple and purifying the church Christ cleansing the temple and purifying the church. The three things we're looking at, number one, the purging and the cleansing of the desecrated temple. The purging and the cleansing of the desecrated temple. Number two, the perplexity and the confusion of the displaced teachers. They were teachers of the law, teachers of religion, teachers of ministries, and teachers of young people and they thought they were the authority 
And yet Christ came and drove them out. And those uh, displaced uh, teachers, they began to ask him, by what authority are you doing this? How is it you are sending us out? How is it you are displacing us? And then Christ said something, he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in how many days? Three days. And then they were confused. And then they replied to him and said, 40 and 6 years, this temple was in building. Are you going to raise it up in three days? They didn't understand. Point number two, the perplexity and the confusion of the displaced teachers. Point number three, the, conf the profession of conversion without a definite transformation profession of conversion there are some people that came to jesus and they say we believe we believe i believe on jesus i believe in jesus he is my savior he is my lord and jesus looked at them and he didn't commit himself unto them he said i don't trust you i don't accept you i don't accept your testimony all you are telling me does not have a good background, a good foundation, the profession of conversion without a definite transformation. Number one, tell me number one. The purging and the cleansing of the desecrated temple. Come back to chapter 2. Chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, uh, up through to verse 17 now, it says, and the Jews' Passover was at hand. And then it tells us in uh, that verse 13, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, verse 14, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew their tables. And he said unto them, That sold those take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered. And his disciples remembered. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. That's point number one. The purging and the cleansing of the desecrated temple. Have you noticed here? There are three things I want to point your attention to. Number one, the misappropriation by the transgressors. Misappropriation by the transgressors. Look at verse 13. It says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand. Read that properly. And the Passover of the Jews was at hand. What a minute. Is it really the Passover of the Jews? Or is it the Passover of the Lord? You see, the name you give to something, to an event, to a feast, or to whatever it is, that name matters a lot. They had changed everything. They had misappropriated the Passover of the Lord. And now they said, it's ours. It's the Jews' Passover. And look at when the Passover was first um, instituted and see what the Bible calls it. I'm looking at Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 11. Exodus chapter 12, verse, tell me. Verse 11. Look at this. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins guarded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. Ye shall eat it in his, listen to this, it is the Lord's Passover. They had misappropriated that. They said, it's our Passover. We can do it the way we want. We can add anything. We can subtract anything. We can modify. And we can do whatever because now it is the Jews' Passover. But it says, it is the Lord's Passover. Look at verse 27. Verse 27. In verse 27 it says that ye shall say it is a sacrifice of what? 
of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshipped. Originally it was named the Lord's Passover but by the time Jesus came they had taken ownership. No, it's ours. I can do it what we want. If he wants it done this way, that was when it was in the sun. It is now in our hands. It is now the Jews pass over. The misappropriation by the transgressors. I'm looking at Levit Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus. This is what you discover in the Bible. That that Passover was not given to them to say it is the Jews Passover. I can do it. They will want. Do anything or want. Leviticus chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 5. In the 14th day of the first month at evening is, tell me, the Lord's Passover. Very clear. Very clear. As you look at this repeatedly, Exodus is the, pass, is the Lord's Passover. Leviticus is the Lord's Passover. I'm reading Numbers chapter 28. Numbers chapter 28. And I'm reading from verse 16. Numbers Chapter 28, verse 16. In the fall, in the 14th day of the first month, it is the Passover of the Lord. The Passover of the Lord. But now, as you come to John, we're looking at John chapter 2, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. They had misinterpreted, they had misappropriated, and they had misunderstood what belonged to the Lord. That's why. They came to fault. That's why somebody must correct them. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ came and he saw that everything was now in the negative. Everything was turned upside down. They were not going the way of the Lord. Anything in the temple, anything in the church that you misappropriate and you think it's ours. This section of the work, that's my area. This uh, kind of uh, ministry, that is mine. And this and this and that, it is mine. And you take it away from the hand of the Lord, misappropriation will bring transgression. And these transgressors, that's what they did. And what we need to do is to return everything to the Lord. It's for his glory. And it's for his ministry. He was the one that instituted it. And he had a purpose for instituting it. And we do not have any right to change it. And then take it to ourselves and say, it's now the Jewish Passover. Point number two. The merchandise in his temple. The merchandise in his temple. We're looking at John chapter 2. John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. And he found and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money sitting. Now, you know what had happened here? They had a Jewish kind of a ceremonial sacrificial system. They were to bring their sheep and sacrifice. Because it says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And they were to keep on celebrating that so that they will remember all the sacrifices that the Lord gave them at the beginning. But now, there were people that were living outside Jerusalem. And they were living in different countries away from the land of Israel. You know what happened? Instead of taking the animal and bringing the animal from their places, they just brought money. And he said, when I get there, if I need a dove, I'll buy it there. If I need a sheep, I'll buy it there. If I need whatever, I'll buy it over there. And so, little by little by little, it was first of all outside the court because their temple was divided into three parts. There's the outer court, there's a holy place and there's a holy of holies. That holy of holies, nobody can get there except the high priest once a year. And then the holy place, they can minister there, their outer court is where you have the women and, the, and all the other people and the Gentiles who had come to worship the God of Israel. But then... Uh, First of all, it was outside. You wanted to come and make your sacrifice. You buy the animal there. You buy the sheep there. You buy whatever there outside. But little by little, why are we staying outside? There is sun outside. They came into the outer court. Little by little, they were inside and inside until when Christ came, everything was inside. 
the people selling. It was like a market. The noise was there and all the whatever, loudness, everything was there. And when he now came, he said, no, this cannot be. And the zeal of the Lord came upon him. I pray you have the zeal of the Lord. That when you see something that shouldn't be in the temple of God, should not be in the house of God, the Spirit of God will guide you. And the Spirit of God will make you know that you are there for a purpose, earnestly contending for the faith, once delivered unto the saints. You will not be afraid. You will not compromise. You will stand for righteousness and you will stand for sound doctrine anywhere you find yourself. Look at this now. I'm reading from chapter chapter 2 verse 15. And it says when he had made small scourge or small cause, he drove them all out. All out. All out. That means there's no partiality. All the people that were wrong, all the people that commercialized the house of God and the love of money are taking over their lives, all of them, he drove them out, whether they were selling sheep or oxen or the, all the money changers, he poured out their thing. And then he told those selling those, take these things away hands from here and make not my father's house and house of, tell me that word, merchandise, merchandise, marketing, commercial things, money-making ventures, so that everybody is coming in now. What can I get? What can I gain? What profit can I make out of the temple worship? I want you to pursue that word. Look at that word. I'm looking at Second Peter chapter 2. The word merchandise. Second Peter chapter 2. And see what people do today. And the Bible calls them false prophets. And the Bible calls them false worshippers. And the Bible calls them carnal people. And the Bible calls them backsliders. And the Bible calls them unfaithful or righteous people. Second Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from, let's read from verse 1. But really we're going to verse 3. It says, but there were false prophets among, also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that put them, and bring upon, upon who? Upon themselves, upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow the pernicious ways. You see, there are many people, whatever a priest does, is always right. Whatever a church father does, is always right. Whatever a church founder does, is always right. Whatever a preacher does, is always right. Whatever a denominational pastor, priest, whatever he does, is always right. Whatever a bishop does, is always right. They do not understand that people deviate and they diverge. They go away from the word of God. It says, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of look at this and through what's the word tell me out loud through covetousness love of money love of money love of money there are people that turn religion into money making business there are pastors there are priests and there are so-called prophets or prophetesses that will turn religion into making money. There are people that turn prayer into money-making business. The people that turn counseling into money-making business. The people that turn temple worship and they worshiping in the church, they turn that to money-making. And it says through covetousness, they shall with faint words make, what's the word? merchandise of you and that's exactly what jesus said should not take place that's what he said should not happen and then he says whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not look at this very important passage in revelation chapter revelation chapter 18 revelation chapter 18 i'm reading here from verse 11 revelation chapter 18 i'm reading from verse what verse 11 look at this and the merchants of the earth shall we and mourn over her. For no man buys their, what's the word? 
merchandise anymore. You see, when we, can, when we take our stand, I will say today, Sunday, I came to church. I didn't come to do business. I came to worship. I came to serve the Lord. And then when you come to the house of God and you prepare your heart and you prepare your mind just to serve the Lord and somebody is uh, saying, hey, come on here. I have a business card. Can I give you? Those are the people. They're turning the house of God into money-making venture. Or somebody is saying, did you know I'm just giving you this address so you can come after the service. We'll talk about it. I do this. I do this. And their mind is not there in the house of God. Their mind is not there in the worship of God. All they want to do is do business. What are we talking about? The people that preach only for money. And they come, they come today, they're talking about money. And then they're saying, give, give. And you, you may not be able to tell. In many of those places, the poor remain poor. And then the rich become richer. And the preachers will say, you give us it is, you give us extra, you give us this and that. And the tithe is not for the church. The tithe is for the preacher. And they are getting that and getting that. And the preacher is uh, living on the ignorance of the people. And they make merchandise of the people. Look at this now in verse 12. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and of uh, fine linen and purple and silk and silver all thy wood and all thine, uh, thine wood and then it says all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of the most precious wood and of the brass and of the iron and marble that's what they were selling look at verse 13 this is serious now and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and bees and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves. Tell me the rest. And the souls of men. And the souls of men. In those uh, many places, uh, the gamble were the souls of the people. It's, in fact, it's like they just sell their souls. They don't care about the souls. They're not worried about what happens to the soul. They may start with the merchandise of sheep and of goats, and of lamb, and of this, and of that, and of chicken, and of whatever, of yam, maybe it's a bazaar, or maybe it's just market in the church, or maybe it is commercialization of everything we do in the church. A, a little thing, if we preach like this, the people that will take that and coin something out, and then they pre before you know what, they're already making money. Or sometimes, you know, our choir singing wonderful, beautiful songs, you'll find somebody that will take uh, those songs, and it's not even one of them. It's not even making any sacrifice. It will record all that, and then before you know what, you are hearing it outside there, and they're making making money out of what is being done in the church. The thing that should be a blessing to people and the thing that should just uh, make people say, I want to get to heaven. I want to be holy. I want to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. They do something out of that and they are trying to make money. They are not concerned about the souls of men anymore. They even sell the souls of those people and they make merchandise of them. We're looking at a First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 9. First Timothy chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 9. It says in chapter 6 uh, verse 9. For they that will be rich. The people come to church. Their purpose is to get rich. Whatever happens, I must get rich. Look at all those thousands of people there. And they come on that Sunday. And they come on that Monday. Ah, my good. How can I be poor when all those people are there? If it's only when the sheet of paper is sell to everybody, I can make thousands and millions out of those people. And there are people who say they are pastors of the church. Maybe it's their wife that, you know, their wife will not attend the Bible study. Their wife is outside there and then is selling this and selling that. And, uh, you know, the pastor, the husband is preaching over here and their wives are busy, their children are busy, they are selling and selling because and nobody can stop them. The workers cannot talk to them because they, they belong to the pastor. Commercialization of spiritual things. I pray it will stop everywhere in all our churches in Jesus' name. 
Look at verse 9. It says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful laws which draw men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10, tell me. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And so that's the reason why Christ went into that temple. And if he came today to our church building, he will do the same. You'll be surprised the kind of people will drive out. You'll be surprised because he knows our hearts, he knows our thoughts, he knows our plans, and he knows why we came to church. He knows why we're there. He knows what we're doing before the service and even during the service and he knows what we're doing after the service. And because of that he will drive them out. I pray you'll not be among those people who will drive out in Jesus' name. Give me really amen. amen. We're coming back to chapter 2, John chapter 2, and I'm going to read now from verse 15 all through to verse 17. And when he had made his coach of small courts, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the money changers, uh, the changers' money, and overthrew their, their tables, and said unto them that sold those, take these things hence. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered. The disciples didn't get angry. The disciples did not frown. Why is Jesus doing like this? Because you understand, these were new disciples who were in chapter 2. He got those disciples in chapter 1. And these disciples, they said, whatever the master does is right. Whatever the master says is right. I've never seen anybody act like this that will make scourge or small cause and drive all those people away. I've never seen that in my life. But he is the master. He is the Messiah. He is the son of God. Whatever he does is right. They didn't complain. And then his action made them to remember the scriptures. It says and his disciples remembered that it was written. Let us read that together. One, two, three, go. I can't hear you people. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. What is that? What is that? We're looking at uh, Psalm 69. Psalm 69. Uh, and I'm reading from verse 9. Psalm 69. And we're reading from verse 9. So that you will see what they remembered. Where well, you see the actions of a leader. The actions of a preacher. The actions of somebody who is honestly contending for the faith. Was delivered unto the saints. You are not judging your heart. You are not saying, what is he saying that? Why is he doing that? Why is he acting like that? Why is he so quick to drive those people out? What if they slap him? What if they fought against him? Then you will learn his lesson. You will not say that. You will remember the scriptures. Look at this. Psalm 69 verse, tell me. Verse 9. It says, for the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Let's come back now. This uh, third section in this part is ministry of transformation. His ministry of transformation. Why did he do this? What did he remember? That made him to do this. How is it when he came like that and he saw them selling and he saw the rowdiness and he saw everything they were doing and said, this cannot be right. Why did he do what he did? We're coming to First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29. You see, if you know what the scripture has commanded, when you see similar situation and you see the things that ought not to be done, you will take action. You will take action, immediate action, inspired action instructive action an action that you'll take and then will instruct other people that's how the master ought to behave that's how the leader ought to behave that's how a child of god ought to behave that's how somebody who is zealous for the things of the lord that's how he ought to act i'm looking at first chronicles chapter 29 verse 5 
verse uh, first chronicles chapter 29 verse sorry second chronicles second chronicles chapter 29 and we're reading from verse 5 quickly turn to second chronicles second chronicles chapter tell me what's the verse now verse 5 wonderful church look at this verse 5 and he said and said unto them hear me ye levites sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the lord god of your fathers look at this and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place jesus knew that he knew the word of god and this is what the lord has commanded that you carry those filthy things out of the house of the lord out of the holy place look at verse 15 in verse 15 and they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the lord by the words of the lord by the words of the lord to what's the next word cleanse the house of the lord by the word of the lord to cleanse the house of the lord look at verse 16 and the priest went into the inner part of the house of the lord to do what to cleanse it and brought out what did they bring out all the uncleanness that that they found in the temple of the lord into the court of the house of the lord and the levites and the levites and the levites took it and carried it out abroad into the book kidron to destroy it so that it will flow away with the water as dirt and so you see that's what they had done and when jesus came and you saw that they had polluted the temple and this was not the original aim or the original plan of god he drove them out let's uh, think about this now as we come to the new testament the physical church building yes it ought to be clean but there is something the bible tells us new testament and it says we are the temple of god your body the temple of god and christ has come number one to cleanse the physical temple and then to cleanse the temple of your body and look at second uh, corinthians chapter six second corinthians chapter six I'm reading from verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with the temple of the living God with the uh, idols? For ye are what? The temple of the living you, a believer, the converted one. You are now a child of God and you are the temple of the living God. As, he, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You see, your body now is the temple of the living God and it doesn't want anything unclean anything defiling inside there he won't see it clean that's why we're talking about his ministry of transformation how does he do that he makes us holy we're looking at leviticus chapter 20 leviticus chapter 20 and i'm reading from verse 7 and verse 8 this is what he wants to do and he wants to do it so that your temple the temple of your body will be clean or be pure I'll be holy. In Leviticus chapter 20 verse 7, sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye, tell me, holy for I am the Lord your God and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. I am the Lord which sanctify you. He looks at you as a temple. And if there are unclean things there, defiling things there, after you come, you say, now you are a child of God and the temple of the living God. He takes the blood of the Lamb and he washes you and he cleanses you. And he says, now you must be clean because you are the temple of the Lord. Psalm 93, I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 93. And we're looking at verse 5, Psalm 93, verse 5. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thy house, O Lord, how long? Forever. 
forever. That means the people before us, they were sanctified. And the people of today, we must be sanctified. And the people that will keep on living until Christ comes, they must be sanctified because holiness becometh thy house forever. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, what he does and what he wants to do, he wants that temple to be pure, wants that temple to be holy, wants that temple to be righteous. In Romans chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 22, being now made free from sin. Somebody has done that for us. His name is Jesus Christ. He's a Messiah. He's a master. He's the propitiation for our sins. He's the one that came to cleanse the temple, and he comes to cleanse now the temple of our body and it says being made free from sin and become the servants to god ye have your fruit unto what's the word there holiness and the end everlasting life the end everlasting life you have your fruit unto holiness it tells us in um, first corinthians chapter three. First corinthians chapter three I'm reading from verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not, don't you know, that she are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Don't you know you are the temple of God if you are born again and he wants to dwell in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple is ye are the temple of god is holy which temple ye are and if anybody will say i don't care about that i don't worry about that i just came to church you didn't just come to church it is so that you'll be clean you'll be righteous you'll be converted and your life will be totally new and says if anybody destroys that defies that temple him will god destroy first corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 verse 19 watch do ye know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You see, you see what those Pharisees did. They said the Passover is the Passover of the Jews, which is not the right thing. Instead of understanding, it is the Passover of the Lord. And because they misappropriated the Passover, that's why they behave the way they shouldn't behave. And the same thing when people say, I'm the owner of my mouth. I'm the owner of my ears. I'm the owner of my body. I can do whatever I want. They misappropriate because it is the temple of God. It is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And you cannot just do whatever you want. Look at verse 20. For ye have bought with a prize therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit which are gods they belong to god i'm looking at ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 we're talking about the temple of god the temple of the living god ephesians chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 19 look at this verse 19 in ephesians chapter 2 it says in verse 19 now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of god and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets jesus christ himself tell me being the chief cornerstone look at this in whom all the building is talking about the whole building now it's talking about the believers all the believers it's talking about the children of god all the children of god it's talking about the whole family of god everyone in whom all all the building fitly framed together grows unto tell me and holy temple in the lord that means then you are a temple of god i'm a temple of god she's the temple of god he is the temple of god all of us together now all of us as a family all of us as a household all of us as children of god as a united family of god together it says we're built unto a holy temple in the lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. He wants to live within us. That's why we don't allow any unclean sin. He cleanses us and will remain cleaner in Jesus' name. 
Now, what he, Jesus Christ, our master, was zealous. He was zealous of good works. He was zealous of the glory of God. We're told in Titus, and what he was, he wants us to be. As he was zealous, he wants us to be zealous too of the right thing. We're looking in at Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us? That he might redeem us from how much iniquity? All iniquity and then do what? And purify unto himself a peculiar people. Tell me the rest. Yes. Zealous of good works. The same way he was zealous to cleanse the temple. The same way you'll be zealous, number one, to make sure that your own temple is clean. Your own temple is sanctified. Your own temple is pure. Your own temple is holy. Your own temple is righteous through and through. And then to make sure that in the church of the living God, we also understand that the church, the physical building, must remain to fulfill the purpose for which God give us that physical building. We're coming to point number two now, the perplexity and the confusion of the displaced teachers. Welcome to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 18. John chapter 2, we're reading from verse, tell me, from verse 18. It tells us in verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest unto us, seeing that doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Verse 21. What did he mean? Verse 21. Say it out. But he spake of the temple of his own body. You see, he told them, they said, What sign do you have? How can you just come single handedly? with authority and then all of us we've been doing this for many years we've been in this temple for such a long time we've been selling the sheep and selling the dope and selling all this for so many years and nobody ever challenged us and you just came now and you're just starting your ministry and you come to drive us out what authority do you have are you greater than us are you so kind of bold and authoritative and autocratic to send us out like that? Show us your credentials. Which Bible school did you go? Who trained you? Who gave you this authority and this permission to do this? And Jesus calmly said, I know what you are going to do. He left them in that place and he went beyond three years to come. He said, I know what you'll do. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. They, they thought, they didn't understand at the beginning. And so they said, you mean you can do that? 46 years, this temple was a built. Was a being built. And then you're going to destroy it. And then you're going to raise it up in three days. And then the Bible tells us he wasn't talking of the physical. You see, and that's what they always think. Give me water to drink. Why is it you asking of me water? And Jesus, if you knew who is asking for, for water from you, you will give him. And then he will give you the water of life. Ah, water of life. Living waters. Where is your bucket? You don't even have any bucket in hand to throw into that well and give me this. He wasn't talking of something physical. He was talking of something spiritual. I pray God will give us understanding. Yeah. I'm going to make it personal. I pray God will give you understanding. Yeah. I'll give you understanding in Jesus name. Yeah. Uh, let's look at this. Number one, the problem with carnal reasoning. The problem with carnal reasoning. He has told them something now spiritual. He has told them something prophetic. He has told them something about his death, about his crucifixion, and about his resurrection. And then they translated that to mean something physical. And let's look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 38. Matthew chapter 12. I was reading here from verse 38. Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 38. In verse 38, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, 
we would see a sign from thee. They're always looking for signs. And he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given to it, but a sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was how many days? Three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The same thing. And it said, what sign do you have? What sign are you showing us? Destroy this temple. I'll raise it up in three days. Talking about his body. In this place, we are asking for what sign can you show us? He said, do you remember Jonah? I was cast into the sea. A whale swallowed him up. He was there three days and three nights. It will happen like that to the son of man. He was always telling them, always telling them, you will kill me, I know, but it's on the purpose because I'm going to be crucified. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and then the third day I will rise again. You will think they didn't understand. Look at this. Matthew chapter 26. They pretended as if, what's he saying? What did he mean by that? Matthew chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 59. Matthew 26 verse, tell me. And the chief, and, and now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came, how many of them? To false witnesses. What did they say? They said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in uh, that's not what he said. That's what he didn't say. I'm able to destroy. He said, You destroy this temple. He didn't say, I will destroy the temple. No. But they, they misquoted him. You see, the people that want to put others into trouble, they will misinterpret your word. They'll misquote your word. They'll say what you didn't say. And they'll say, That's what you said. He didn't say, I will destroy the temple. Look at what they said. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God. And to build it in three days but you know they were all pretenders they were all pretenders look at this one in matthew chapter 27 matthew chapter 27 i'm reading from verse 39 matthew chapter 27 what verse verse 39 and they that passed by reviled him walking their heads saying thou that destroys the temple you see that? Thou that destroys the temple. Did he say we'll destroy the temple? I can't hear you. No. no. They said thou that destroy the temple and buildest it in three days. Save thyself. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. We're coming to this next section now. And this is the prophecy of Christ's resurrection. The prophecy of Christ's resurrection. Actually, what he meant was that they will kill him. They will try to get rid of him. But in three days, he will rise again. And let's uh, look at uh, how he had been telling his own disciples that over and over. Matthew chapter 16 verse 21. Matthew chapter 16. And I'm reading from verse 21. Look at this. Uh, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, tell me the rest, and be raised again the third day. He told them from the very beginning and they should have understood. He didn't say I'll destroy the temple. He said, you destroy the temple. This temple, after all, he makes us the temple of God. He calls us the temple of God. And he himself, he referred to himself as temple. And he said, you destroy the temple and you'll be surprised. A miracle will happen. I'll raise it up in three days. We're looking at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. All of them recorded this. They knew what he was saying. That he will die and then the third day he will rise again. Our Lord is risen. 
resurrection is real and you believe in your heart that he died for your sin and that god raised him up the third day you'll be saved in jesus name mark chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 31 mark chapter 9 reading from verse 31 for he touched his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, that, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise, tell me, the third day. He shall rise the third day. Over and over, over and over, he mentioned that Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 31. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 31. Then he took unto him twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day, what will happen? shall rise again he rise again and so he told them over and over uh, what was the reason for that crucifixion what's the reason for that death what's the reason for that burial and what's the reason for that resurrection first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 3 First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that how that Christ died, why? For our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Let's come back to John chapter 2. Now you understand what Jesus Christ was saying when he told them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. We're coming back to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 21 and verse 22. And he spake of the temple, but he spake of the temple of his body. But he spake of the temple of his body. The first question is this. Those Pharisees, did they really understand what he said? When he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days or the third day. They understood later, but they pretended not to understand. You see, there are people, they understand what the Lord is saying. But when they think it will work against us, it will not favor us. And it will destroy our position in the temple and see what he has done. He drove us out like that. We must revenge, we must fight back. And therefore, whatever he says, we'll pretend as if we don't understand. How do we know they understand? Look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 62. Matthew 26. Are you there? I said Matthew chapter, tell me. And then what's the verse? 62. Very quickly, very quickly. Look at this. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou not? Chapter, oh, that's chapter 26. Um, let me search for it very well. That's not the right verse. And we're looking at, let, let's see it from chapter 27. Chapter 27. What chapter now? Say it if you're sure. Okay, let's look at this. Chapter 27, and we're looking at it from verse 62. Verse 62. Are you there now? Now, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto who? Pilate. Look at this saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver, while he was yet alive, after uh, said, while he was yet alive, said, after three days, what? They knew, they knew. They came to Pilate now after they crucified him, after he was buried, and he came and said, Sir, we remember now that that deceiver 
said that he will die. After three days, he'll rise again. Look at this. Command, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. They knew that he said it will rise again. But whatever they did, thank God, our Lord rose again. Yeah. My Jesus rose again. Yeah. My Savior rose again. Yeah. My Deliverer rose again. Yeah. Our Redeemer is risen from the dead. And nobody can cover that up. He rose for your justification. He rose for your salvation. He rose for your redemption. And as you believe all the things they were trying to hide, as you believe eternal life will come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now his own disciples also, they remembered that he had said so, that he will rise again. And look at this, chapter 2 now, chapter 2. I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 22 of John. John chapter 2, verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead. Did Jesus rise from the dead? His disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. They believed and I believe. I said I believe. That's why we're saved. Because he rose for us so that all our sins he will take away. We come to point number three now. The profession of, con of conversion without a definite transformation. We're coming to John chapter 2. Reading from verse 23 to verse 25. John chapter 2 from verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover. In the feast day. Many believed in his name many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did but jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men these people said yes we believe the pharisees don't believe but we believe sadducees don't believe but we believe all those priests and all those elders they don't believe but we believe because we'll see your miracle about it then it says but jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man you see, true faith is preceded by thorough repentance. If uh, somebody does not repent and he just comes, I saw miracle, I saw healing, I saw showers of blessing, I saw this and that. I believe, I believe, and there's no repentance. I believe, I believe, there's no cleansing. I believe, I believe, there's no change of life. I believe, I believe, and there's no turning around away from sin and turning onto righteousness. It says, these people said, yes, we believe. We saw the miracle. He can multiply the fish. He can multiply the food. He can do this and he can do that. And Jesus will not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And because he knew that these were not genuine believers. It says, they believed but. They believed but. Why did he say that? They believed but their hearts were not changed. They believed, but their thoughts were not transformed. They believed, but their desires were still the same. They believed, but their inward motives still remained the way it was. They said they believed, but their minds remained the same. They said they believed, but their conduct, their character remained the same. They said, I believe, I believe, but... Their passion and their pursuits remained the same. The inner drive and the inner direction of their lives still remained the same. And because of that, no change, no true conversion, 
no heaven and jesus will not commit himself unto them and look at john chapter 12 verse 42 john chapter 12 verse 42 i believe i believe we must go beyond that there must be repentance there must be a change of heart a change of life a change of direction a change of the inner motivation and drive we're looking at john chapter 12 and i'm reading from verse 42 are you there have you opened your Bible? It, it says, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many believed on him. Look at the next word. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Lest they should drive them, they should put them out of the synagogue. Look at the comment on them. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They loved the praise of men. They were not seeking the glory of God alone. What will they think about me? What will they do to me? How will they react to me? And because they could not really believe on, believe on the Lord transparently. That's why the Lord will not commit himself unto them. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, so you understand, it's not just, I believe, I believe. There must be thorough repentance, change of life, change of direction, and change of motive. You are going this way before you turn around, and now you go the right direction. In John chapter 8, verse 13, then Simon himself believed also. He was a sorcerer. It was a man that he said, this is the great power of God. But then he didn't turn away from all that uh, intention of wanting money out of religion. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered and beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. But look at verse 18. And when Simon saw the throat they lay on of the apostles hands the holy ghost was given he offered them what tell me out loud uh, some people you can tell their attitude to money is still the same their passion their drive for money is still the same their covetousness is still the same and their uh, desire to make money at all costs even if it's from religion is still the same it says and simon when he saw th uh, that through the laying on of the apostles signs, the holy ghost was given he offered the money saying give me also this power that on whomsoever i lay hands he may receive the holy ghost but peter thank god peter was not a money loving apostle he was not a covetous apostle it was not a, an apostle wanted to make merchandise of religion look at this but peter said unto him tell me the money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent. You should have done that before. You should have turned away from all your sins before. You should have turned away from all this drive for money, desire for money. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. We're coming to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I read from verse 5. These people who say I believe, I believe, but they say carnal. These people I believe, I believe, and there's no change of heart and no change of life. Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Even after they say they are believed, they are still after the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You see, all those, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, we must turn away from them. There must be a repentance. There must be a turning around. And then we say we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we demonstrate that, that faith, by the change of life. Otherwise, we just say, I believe, I believe, and then there's no change and the Lord will not commit himself unto such a person. Titus chapter 1 in Titus chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 16. Titus 
chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God. There we are. They profess, they give big testimonies. I've come to the Lord. This is my church now. I'm a child of God. But what is the change of life? It says they profess that they know God, but in works deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Revelation chapter 3. We're reading from verse 1. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, and unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works. Look at this, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, tell me, and I did. Thou hast a name. I'm a child of God. I believe in the living God. I'm alive. I'm alive in Christ. I'm a new creature in Christ. I can't see the newness. We can't see the newness. It is still the same old creature. And then God said here, Jesus said here, you have a name that you live, but you are dead. I pray change will happen in every life. New life. New creature. New behavior. New character, Amen. new conduct, the evidence that we have known the Lord and there is a change of life. Please understand, I believe, I believe, I believe, that's not enough. I believe, that's not enough. Because they said they believed and Jesus did not commit himself unto them. I'm looking at James chapter 2. James chapter 2, we're reading from verses 19 and 20. James chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Thou believest that there is one God that doest well. But remember, the devils also believe and they tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without corresponding action. Faith without thorough repentance. Faith without a change of life. Faith without transformation of life. It says that is vain. Revelation chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, look at verse 8. But the fearful... And unbelieving, after they say, I believe, I believe, they're still afraid of occultic power. They're still afraid that's a covenant they made with the devil before. If I get out of it, I don't know what will happen. And therefore, they still belong to that kind of old covenant. Devil's covenant. Satan's covenant. It says, but the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and the allmongers, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and... How many liars? Tell me out loud. All, All liars, where are they going to be? Shall have their part in the lake which burned it with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are rich in the Lamb's book of life. When you come to the Lord, say, Lord, bye-bye to sin. Bye-bye to darkness. Bye-bye to evil. Bye-bye to fighting. Bye-bye to drunkenness. Bye-bye to marijuana. Bye-bye to all those occult things. I come to the Lord. There's thorough repentance. And then you embrace the Lord. You believe the Lord. I will go. Well, come what may. Come what may. I've made up my mind. I've decided I will follow Jesus. And you'll follow Jesus till the end. And then he forgives your sin. He changes your life. He makes you a new creature in Christ. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, and behold, and in your life, in your heart, in your family, in your character, wonderful. It will happen. For many of us, it has happened. 
I pray the Lord will confirm it in every life in Jesus' name. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. When that salvation comes, see what it will do. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present life looking this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and savior jesus christ who gave himself for me who gave himself for me who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works there'll be something to show for that compassion zealous of good works a new character a new behavior a new life and then we know that's a brother that's a sister you're on your way to everlasting life you'll get there i will get there we'll get there in jesus name Let's rise up and tell the Lord what we have learned today. See what the Lord has revealed to us. You are the temple of God. He wants that temple to be clean. He wants that temple to be holy. He wants that temple to be pure. Why don't you open your mouth and call upon the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Let there be a change. Let there be a transformation. Let the power of the cross of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection come upon my life. Turn my life around and make me a new creature in Christ. He will do it.